What is up everybody, Jeremy Eisenfire here and welcome to the channel. Episode 6 of Shogun is here, and we got another phenomenal episode where we learned quite a bit about some of our characters, including Mariko and Ochiba in particular, and the connection that the two of them had as children, while also learning a little bit more about Mariko's father and the crimes that he was accused of committing. Along with also learning just exactly why Ochiba despises Toronaga so much. The episode starts off with a flashback to 22 years ago, where we see a young Mariko with her father still alive, as they are being brought into the service of Lady Ochiba's father at the time. And right off the bat, these scenes clearly establish the deep friendship that Ochiba and Mariko once had, both as children and even growing up into adulthood, right up until the point where Mariko was married off to Bontaro, which I believe was the last time that the two have seen each other. We also get a small glimpse as to what Mariko was referring to in the previous episode calling the former ruler of Japan a murderous tyrant, as we see him beheading multiple victims with Mariko's father attempting to intervene, had it not been for Toronaga stopping him. We also start to see a little bit of the disconnect between Mariko and her father, with Mariko believing that her father is simply sending her away. Little does she know that he is marrying her off to Bontaro in order to keep her safe, knowing that he will most likely be condemned after what he is planning. We also get a really interesting scene of Mariko practicing with the Naganata, which of course was the standard weapon of choice for female warriors during this time period, which is just another reason of the show's commitment to authenticity, and we see she is quite adept at using it as well. And I really appreciate how the show is establishing how well-trained she is with the Naganata, as it will come into play later on in future scenes, as she gets involved in quite a hairy fight scene. But next, we see Toronaga addressing his troops after the devastating earthquake that took quite a sizable portion of his army. We also see Blackthorn get rewarded for his most recent service in saving Toronaga from the earthquake, where not only does Toronaga gift him with two new swords but also grants him his own substantial fief and the title of Chief Admiral, while also placing him in charge of the Cannon Regiment, a title that we learn later on that Blackthorn really doesn't want as he still desires to leave Japan for good. And you can definitely start to see some of the jealousy start to seep into some of Toronaga's men, seeing all of the favors that Blackthorn keeps getting bestowed upon, when most of them still look at him as a foreign barbarian, and not the Hatamoto that he has been granted. A sentiment that we see reflected in Omi and Yabushigi later. And I've really been enjoying the theme of Yabushigi constantly writing and rewriting his will throughout the season never knowing when death might come, as he is starting to feel the walls close in on him more and more. And I really can't praise Tatanobu Asano's performance enough as Yabushigi. He has really been phenomenal in the role. We also get a pretty interesting scene between Toronaga and Bontaro, where we start to see a different side of Bontaro for the first time, as he is seeking forgiveness for Toronaga for disrupting the peace in Blackthorn's home. And we certainly start to see a little bit of Bontaro's vulnerable side here as he is explaining to Toronaga how he loses himself in Mariko's presence and how she has always been as cold as ice towards him. And we start to see a little bit more of the dynamics of their relationship where Bontaro was hoping that Mariko would be grateful that the marriage to him essentially saved her life when in fact Mariko really just wants to kill herself to honor her family. And to add insult to injury, Buntaro is also noticing that Mariko is not as cold around Blackthorn, which I imagine is only adding to Buntaro's jealousy. So we're really starting to see just how strained the marriage between Buntaro and Mariko truly is. And with Tornaga also sensing the hostilities, he orders Buntaro to isolate himself away from Mariko for the period of seven days. So it'll be interesting to see if Buntaro does indeed stay away for the whole seven-day period. We also see Blackthorn again try to convince Toronaga that the Portuguese are also an enemy to him as well, as he continues to ask Toronaga for the return of his ship and crew so that he may disrupt the trade routes of the Portuguese, which in turn will diminish the profits that are going to the Christian regions on the council. And one thing I do find a tad bit annoying about Mariko's character is her inability to translate what Blackthorn is saying properly. She takes many liberties with what Blackthorn is saying and very rarely conveys exactly what he means to Toronaga. 
And in this scene in particular, we are definitely seeing some of her bias towards the Catholic Church, with Mariko being Catholic herself, not wanting to believe the full gravity of their crimes that Blackthorn has alluded to. We are also seeing that the city of Osaka is going from bad to worse, as we see an attack on Toronaga's estate with inside the castle, where we learn that Ashido has essentially taken the other regents hostage and is holding them captive until they can come to a vote against Toronaga. And if nothing else, these events definitely showcase how much influence Lady Ochiba has over Ashido and the other members of the council. And even the Catholics are starting to realize that the campaign against Toronaga has been vastly accelerated, which Father Martin also attributes to the influence that Ochiba has over the council, and suggests that now it might be time for them to look towards Toronaga as an ally, as with Lady Ochiba in charge, and especially with her being no friend of the Catholic Church, they might come to a more favorable alliance with Toronaga. And I also really enjoyed the scene of Hamamatsu cutting his way out of Osaka in order to get to Toronaga to inform him of what's happening in the city. And if nothing else, it seems like at least some of the fellow regents are starting to realize that they are becoming nothing more than pawns now that Lady Ochiba is here. A situation we see come to a climax later on in the episode. And speaking of Lady Ochiba's influence, we see it on display yet again when she essentially chooses Toronaga's replacement on the council herself, offering up a candidate that they can undoubtedly control. And we also start to learn exactly why Lady Ochiba despises Toronaga as much as she does, as she blames Toronaga for the death of her father. Even though it was not Toronaga who delivered the killing blow, she very much blames him and credits him for the planning of it. Which, if nothing else, gives us a little bit of an example as to why she is willing to go to such lengths to end Toronaga's reign. But with Hiromatsu finally making it to Ajiro and informing Toronaga of what's happening in Osaka, Hiromatsu also suggests that they enact a plan called Crimson Sky. Which is essentially an offensive where they would attack the city of Osaka, killing all of the regents and installing Toronaga as sole regent essentially making Toronaga the next Shogun. A plan that Toronaga is not in favor of at first, as being Shogun is never something he desired. That is, of course, until he hears of Ashido and Ochiba's latest treachery at killing a fellow member of the council, the same member, in fact, who would not confirm their replacement for Toronaga. So it seems Lady Ochiba was not exaggerating as she stated that the time for politics has come to an end as we see her and Ashido continue to up the ante in their efforts against Toronaga, which could ultimately end up proving fatal for Ochiba and Ashido, as they have now forced Toronaga's hand into enacting Crimson Sky, a plan to assault Osaka and kill everyone in power, installing Toronaga as the next Shogun. So it seems like the stage is definitely set for Episode 7 to see some fireworks, to say the least. But overall, it was another phenomenal episode, and it was really nice to see some of the backstory behind not only Mariko, but Lady Ochiba's childhood as well, and seeing the deep connection the two characters had as children, while also seeing some of the events that forged Lady Ochiba into the person she is today, along with Mariko. But definitely let me know your thoughts and comments down below, which part of episode 6 stood out to you the most. But that is going to do it for our breakdown for episode 6 of Shogun, Ladies of the Willow World. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit a like on your way out and consider subscribing to stay up to date on all of our upcoming content. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to everybody out there for watching and a huge thank you to all of the channel members. And we will see you on the next one.